we actually call our solution construction without disruption. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do it conventionally, Mm -hmm. if you do it with prefabricated, it's a lot less disruptive Mm -hmm. on the environment, Mm -hmm. right? Because everything shows up, right, at basically sort of one time to be assembled versus built on Mm -hmm. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our show. I'm Jenny Woon with In the House. I'm Tony Singh, and we're here with Doug Hayden. Hi, Doug. How are you? I am great. Great, great. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming on. Well, you are on our show because you are working on something major that will change the landscape of real estate and bring on more homes to the market. Uh, you are the founder and president of um, and the SC, SCSO of Arthrodo yeah. Group, your uh, your prefabricating solution to convert unused office space to residential real estate uh, and mixed use office space. Am I correct to say that? I know that there's yeah more. Yeah, yeah. there's two pronounce there's two pronunciations. Uh, people either say uh, Arthrodo or Arthrodo. Okay, we we internally prefer Arthrodo. But it doesn't matter how you pronounce it. Yeah, (laughs) I heard from another interview. It's about it's a Greek uh, term for coming together or bringing together. Join Join for join. Yeah, and that's why like uh, arthritis and it it tends to come from that kind of delineation within Mm -hmm. within Greek. The reason that we went with that is because when we typed in the, the into Google, what's the Greek word for prefabrication or prefabricated? It's like a mile long, right? And nobody could pronounce it. So it was like, what's the Greek word for modular? Oh, arthroto. So anyway, arthroto. and there was no dot .com. Yeah, uh, so. Okay. So there you go. That's how the name that's came the out. That's the backstory. Arthroto. Arthroto. <laughs> yeah, that's the back. Yeah. Arthroto. <laughs> arthroto. <laughs> arthroto. Now we're confused. Okay. But, yeah. uh, uh, well, you have a background in real estate. So. Um, yes. Yeah. First off, I'm going to ask you a question. We always forget this. Yeah, let's do it. What is yeah. your superpower? Um, I would say there's a, it's probably a combination. Uh, one is just to be able to join things, right? So see how different things connect. So it was really obvious what was going on. And I'll just use the, the company as a prime example, right? Uh, prior to COVID, the city of Calgary was doing a conversion program. So they already, they were actually the furthest along in North America. So, it, you know, I could see that, oh yeah, it made a lot of sense, right? Empty office buildings convert to residential, Right. Prior to that, I'd actually worked at a company that did full build out of office that way. So prefabricated office. So having seen that, it was like, oh, okay. So I started talking to some of the building owners and developers and said, would you be interested in looking at prefabrication versus traditional construction of drywall and all the rest of the big mess and trades tripping over and all the, all the rest of that. So long story short, it, it was always about price. They would always go, oh, but what's the cost per square foot of your solution versus ours? And if it doesn't pencil out, even to the penny, right, they'll go one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, but along comes COVID, literally changes everything. And I mean, re- it's it, like, it's surprising what's still going on. But I saw what was going to come in commercial real estate. And it was the collapse of commercial real estate. And not only was it the collapse because people weren't going to go back to the office, but the interest rate reset is causing, like, there's a, there's a wall of debt, like mm. literally $1.5 trillion in the United States is coming due. So you see all these things happening. So, you know, you know, as they say, you know, when there's chaos, that's opportunity, right? So what would be the opportunity? And so that's, that's how we put this together. So the, the, the superpower is vision, like it's just seeing down the road and how things tie together. Yeah. And then the, the second part of that superpower is finding the people that can make it happen yeah. so you can execute on that vision. Yeah, so and opportunity. I would say that yeah. would be my super, yeah, well, there you go. That's <laughs> entrepreneur, opportunist. Yeah, yeah you, you, all of the All above. of the same, same boat, right? So, okay. But thanks for the question. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you, you want to give a quick background about yourself? Because I, you're, you've been a realtor before too. Correct. Uh, both commercial and residential. So I'm going to go way back in the way back mm-hmm. machine. So 
Um, I actually started, I studied film and television and I wound up, um, not in film and television, I wound up running data centers for oil companies. Mm. So the likes of SO and, and Shell um, and, and Petro-Canada. So I used to run those data centers. And after about 10 years of that, I got tired of it and I was looking for opportunity. And lo and behold, I just had a penchant for finding small companies that were doing innovative things and then finding a fit for them in larger companies. So for almost 10 years, I moved to Toronto uh, from Calgary, I'm from Calgary originally, moved to Toronto to do this. So I would find companies and then I would get them into Apple computers. So I had a track record of four successful placements. Ah, so, mm-hmm. and, and they're, they're fair sized, right? I mean, we're talking like anywhere from, you know, a couple million to, you know, tens of millions. Um, uh, so I did that. Then I, I had an opportunity to come back to Calgary to work with a company called Evans Consoles. So they had a division that they wanted to do some things with. Um, that didn't work out. I was not even a year. And so, but now I'm stuck in Calgary. What am I going to do? So uh, I wound up talking with the group from SMED. And because, again, of my background, uh, they had a raised floor system. I know this is probably not super interesting, but basically we could standardize all these buildings that are being built with a raised floor system. Mm-hmm. So I basically, we automatically got um, uh, chosen as the supplier of choice from Cisco Systems, from Lucent Technologies, from Northern Telecom, because we could come in and build out a whole office and incorporate all their technology. So that's the vision. That's part of why this is all coming together. And in doing that, I got a commercial license so that I could go and work in the, that space and understand how they, you know, they built the TIs in and how, how they came up with their numbers. So that was a lot of what I did. Uh, along comes dot com, mm. right? Then guess what? Out of that business. And um, I wound up doing commercial or not commercial residential real estate with my wife for geez, close to 20 years. Mm. And wow, that's a long I don't know, time. It's well over. Yeah, it's like 15, 1,600 transactions, wow. right? It's Which just the two of us. We've had her on our podcast yeah. Yeah, she's as well. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So, yeah, so a good understanding of residential real estate and technology yeah. so, and processes. Perfect. And right. that's exactly why you're here. So, for our listeners, explain to the listeners what the crisis is right now between the tech industry, uh, commercial office spaces, and residential housing, because you've basically found a specific segment and hole in that market and you're yeah. creating something new. Yeah. <laughs> so I, again, it's sort of take, I'll take the 40,000 foot level. So when you, you're trying to, when you're looking at everything that's sort of going on and you touched on technology. So what COVID, uh, Bill Gates said it best. He said, we've been drawn into the way we work 10 years into the future. I mean, if you think about it prior to COVID, how comfortable was anybody even doing these things like podcasting mm-hmm. or getting on a mm-hmm. Zoom call or anything? They weren't. They avoided it. They'd rather get on an airplane and fly somewhere, right, to yeah. meet with people as as, as be on, on video. And now um, nobody wants to get on an airplane anymore. They'd rather sit in their pajamas <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> kind of get as much work done as they can. So, and, and part of this too, as you see it with tech companies, because tech companies are, are demanding that workers go back to the office. Mm. And the workers are saying just the opposite. They're going to say, nope, not happening. It is not going to happen. I don't, I don't want to get in my car anymore. I don't want to travel. I don't want to get up in the morning, deal with my kids and all the rest of it, right? It's just, it's mayhem. So if there's a way that I can build my life, and this is around white collar workers primarily, right? If there's a way that I can structure my life, that mm-hmm. I can do both work and have a balanced life, that's the way I want to go. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's to the point where I strongly believe because, um, Oh, I can't remember who it was, but I was just listening to another podcast about about this very thing. And their company just did a 180 on it. They said, look, it's pretty clear nobody wants to come back in the office. We have to make our workers happy. They basically took out 20 floors of office space and just just turned that all into one office in a in a what's called a marquee building. So they went from one building into a marquee building, marquee address. Basically, all you've got is conference rooms, meeting rooms, and food. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what gets people back into the office. They know people aren't, it's like a we work, right? Kind of environment. So, um, so that, that's really what's going on, right? So Doug, um, what's the the magnitude of this? Like whether you want to describe it in dollar amount or square footage, that's vacant, uh, that's vacant or example of companies where they have to shut down what office buildings are going dark or being ghosted and what major cities are, are seeing, uh, experiencing this apocalypse. 
So it is all across North America that like it's all across North America. Some cities are hit harder. New York is hit harder. Calgary was hit hard. Edmonton just started a program mm. um, to, to kind of convert. In Canada, it's really Calgary and Edmonton. But if you go to the States, I mean, it's, it's a lot of the bigger cities, Dallas, Minneapolis, Washington, San Francisco, Los Angeles, right? The list is, I mean, we've identified 13 cities that uh, are, have assets in distress, need distress. Uh, Minneapolis is by far and away the furthest, but you ask for numbers. Like I said, it's $1.5 trillion worth of debt in office reset in the next three years. So mortgages are basically going to double on office buildings. Mm-hmm. So imagine if you own an office building, right? Not only are you losing tenants, but your mortgage is just about to double. Mm-hmm. Right, it's a lot of what what consumers are facing in Canada, on their their own personal houses. So you've got that going on, right? So you've got this hollowing out, and that's having a drastic effect on city cores. San Francisco is probably being the, the outlier mm-hmm. where you can really see the worst of it. Mm-hmm. So, does converting make sense? And part of where Calgary was, and they did the extensive studies, it was if we can convert to residential, it's going to increase the tax base and it's going to revitalize the core. So there are a number of factors, the number of benefits by doing it. You mentioned several cities. Which municipalities, in your opinion, are most affected by um, housing shortage? Well, uh, oh man, almost all of them. It tends to be coastal, right? So Vancouver, Toronto, mm. right in, in Canada are the are the biggest hit, although now it's it seems to be happening almost everywhere. Mm. And as you move into the United States, right, it's New York. Right, as the one on, on the the um, east coast that's most affected, and on the west coast, uh, housing shortages in Seattle, San Francisco, mm-hmm. Los Angeles, San Diego. Um, you know, it it it's extensive, but it's also in the middle. Mm-hmm. You see, Dallas is a big one. Houston, another one. Like I said, Minneapolis. So th- there's a large number that are affected by it, uh, and it's simply the need for for housing. Just to give you an example, in the United States, they're short five million apartments. Right, that that's the current demand. Just current. Uh, New York City's five hundred and sixty thousand. Toronto's three hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. that's what they're short right now. So, is this going to alleviate that by converting buildings? It's not going to, but it's going to help. Mm-hmm. Right, and it's going to revitalize the core, and it's going to bring in a tax base again. You have an empty office building; you're not getting anything tax wise. There's no businesses to tax, so you're better off having residents there. Um, I have a question about this, but we just had uh, two other guests uh, on today. We were talking about the Airbnb changes in British Columbia. <laughs> now, it speaks yeah. to housing though, right? So the intention of um, bringing in rules in 2024 for the one of the rules is that you can only run an Airbnb if it's out of your primary residence out here, right? So secondary yeah. properties that were for investment purposes only are no longer um, allowed to be run as Airbnb unless they're in a, a couple specific um, areas that are excluded. This, yeah. to me, what you're talking about seems like a far better way and far better reach of utilizing vacant spaces, mm-hmm. retrofitting them. I don't know if that's the right word. Retrofitting or, yeah. or yeah, revitalizing them. Yeah, for retro- okay. Yeah. For residential housing because there is a need for it. This seems to me a lot smarter <laughs> than just increase <laughs> changing rules for Airbnb. What's your thoughts yeah. on your thought on that, Doug? Well, and it's funny because you know Airbnb was going to work itself out one way or the other, right? I mean it's, it's saturated. It's a saturated market. Mm-hmm. So it was sort of it was it was changing. I don't think uh, it's out what what you're talking about. Was that Vancouver that came up with yeah, that? Yeah, British Columbia. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So New New York came up with something very similar. So basically they took the rug out from under yeah. anybody that had Airbnbs, which again, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. What they're trying to do is force them to do long-term rentals, yeah. right? If they were going that way anyway, because they just, it was, Airbnb just wasn't kind of paying the way it used to. Tough, and yeah. New York may be a little different, but, but I mean, even in New York, they have rent control and there are 13,000 units unoccupied of wow. rentable housing in New York. And the reason they're not renting is the owners can't bring them up to code because they can't Ooh. make enough rent to cover the cost, but they are controlled. To, so a lot of municipalities that want this are tripping over themselves mm-hmm. like the, with their own. Like, I, I just don't think, I don't think that helps per se, like the, just focusing on, on Airbnb. If you want to do something, then just tax them like a hotel. 
right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. there, there were other ways that you could do it that probably would actually brought you more revenue and probably would have helped alleviate the, 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 the situation even better. But anyway, that's my thought on that. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, thank well, I was going to say in answer to your question, what most of these buildings that are converted are converted into rental units. Mm-hmm. So long, what's called long-term, so one year lease typically, right? Or they're converted to hospitality, to a hotel. So there's several that are being converted to hotel or a mixed use. Mm -hmm. So the top floor is, right, hospitality or or rental and then, you know, vice versa. So, you know, a lot of the buildings, especially those around 30 stories that are being converted, Mm -hmm. they might look at, oh, we'll do the top 20 as residential, the bottom 10 as hospitality, Mm -hmm. as a hotel. And actually, we're talking with two hotel uh, chains right now to partner with uh, looking for buildings. Okay. So how how does, uh, and I don't want to get the name wrong now because we're talking about pronunciation. Don't worry about it. Okay. How does Arthrado <laughs> play um, a role in this specific converse, conversion, I guess? Like with you and your company. Great question. Yeah. yeah. So when we sat back and looked at this, um, our primary market was going to be building owners. Um, some developers, but primarily the building owners is probably our target. And also anybody that, that is holding a distressed asset. So that's companies like maybe Brookfield or Ivanhoe, Cambridge, or a pension fund, anybody like that, or, or family trusts. Mm -hmm. So those are the people because they have that. And I think you mentioned apocalyptic or, but anyway, they're calling these zombie buildings, right? So a zombie building is a building that would have a high vacancy rate. Um, there's not, the owner's like struggling. Well, I don't want to sell the building because I'll probably get a big tax hit. Mm. What else can I do with the building? And um, and I'll and I'll talk about something else that's going on, especially with the distressed asset. But in that case, we felt they're probably the most likely target for a solution. And we we actually call our solution construction without disruption, mm-hmm. because if you don't do it conventionally, mm-hmm. if you do it with prefabricated. It's a lot less disruptive mm-hmm. on the environment, mm-hmm. right? Because everything shows up, right, at basically sort of one time to be assembled versus built on site. Mm-hmm. So we're building off site, so you avoid all of that. Ah. So that helps those owners, right? Because then they can still keep tenants in a building. There's one in Dallas that uh, we're looking at doing right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so they can keep people in the building while they're actually converting. Wow. So there's a big plus there. Now, on the other side of this coin, uh, what's going on, because we said we're looking at purchasing distressed assets ourselves, is so imagine if you bought a building before COVID and you paid $100 million for it, okay? Along comes COVID. Now that you're not getting rent for the building, right? Or the people are going to be, they're not renewing, that's for darn sure. Mm -hmm. So you're losing tenants, you're losing income. And now your $100 million is about, you know, the mortgage payment is almost going to double, if not double. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Well, honestly, a lot of them are just giving the keys back to the banks. Yeah. So we're actually talking to the banks too about how do we how do we help with that, or we'll just purchase them outright. We're setting up a group that's just going to purchase outright mm-hmm. right. buildings so that, to convert, that the and then we'll put them in a re- yeah. That was the question yeah. I have. What your what is your approach? Because are you more of a supplier or a construction company, or are you more of an investor where you're you're like buying these buildings in distress and then converting them because of capital so we have, reserves? Yeah, we have both, Jenny. So we have, so we have a group that we just put together in the last couple of months. It's called the Distressed Assets Group. So they're running. We're running um, algorithms on all the cities that we've identified. That, and by the way, it has to be a city that's open to conversion. There's no point going to a city that is not open to conversion. Mm-hmm. It, you won't get your permits, uh, right? In terms of like even getting um, you know. Uh, the the whole building, right? Having to be reclassified from office to residential, right? The cities that want to convert will do that. So you don't have to go out and get the building reclassified or anything else. So uh, they're just a lot friendlier to do to doing that, right? So we can't focus on any city that doesn't have that. Mm-hmm. It's pointless. Mm-hmm. So course. we only focus on the cities that are very much, you know, geared towards conversion. And then we're running, okay, this building hasn't paid its rent for X number of months, or it's in distress, or the bank owns it. And then we try to get in contact with the owners. Um, So obviously, we're using commercial real estate tools to do that. So anyway, that's a distressed asset team. The other is conversion as a service, Mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people that want this as a service. So we connect with, um, there's a wide range, there's 
we have a couple partners that are um, very specific general contractors. They do more, uh, and you said it yourself, um, Tony, they do more um, retrofit. Mm -hmm. So those types of contractors are ideal to work with for us because when you're converting a building, you have to redo all the mechanical, electric, and plumbing. So that it, that's your first thing. That's your first thing you have to do in, the, in that whole, what's called the stack. So it, when you're converting, now here's the other thing that's going on. Building owners are finally starting to look at their assets as, oh, maybe they'll be more malleable than we think. Maybe the office building can do more than just be an office building. Maybe it can be life sciences. Maybe mm -hmm. it can be hospitality, maybe residential. So now they're looking at, at it as more of a frame that eventually they can change. And that's the other thing about our solution. We can convert a building, example, 20 stories, convert 10 of those stories to residential. If the, if the rest of the building gets vacated any time, we already know exactly what to do mm -hmm. to turn the rest of the building over to residential. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. That just makes so much sense. <laughs> uh, Doug, <laughs> what, kind, or what country or city do you foresee as the outlier or I guess, what, what are we asking here? See the most volume in this conversion uh, as possible. Well, we're focused on North America. Okay. Uh, I mean, the, the opportunities in North America are just, are just huge. We have had a couple calls from the UK. Mm. Um, now, it depends where you go, right? I mean, you literally, China has the exact opposite problem. Way too much housing, right? Whereas, you know, here, it's not enough. So clearly, we're focused here. I think New York is the one city that, of any city in North America, that's the one that volume-wise will probably do the most. Then after that, you're going to see San Francisco and Los Angeles. Those are the those are the three cities that we're really focused in. Hmm. So yeah. so in our team mm -hmm. is actually um, our, our head of of um, governance and government relations. He's actually in California. Oh, I see. And so, how have you converted um, buildings already successfully? Uh, we have not, but our, our partners have. Okay. okay. So we, what we're doing is they've, they've been involved in projects, but they've never been focused on this as the, a whole, the, you know, like converting us as, yeah. as a business. As, yeah. Right. And you got to remember, we're only four months old. <laughs> right. So like literally. Yep. So Thanks for sharing. I mean, yeah. so we're, folks. we're, <laughs> yeah. we're and, quoting. And, yeah. Other than the Go vacancy, ahead. so what factors are under consideration for buildings best for this type of conversion? Like, what if, what if it was um, a, a building that was like half burnt, mm -hmm. and but is it worth knocking the whole thing yeah. down or rebuilding from where it's existing? So, I, well, that, that's a damaged building, so it's probably you're going to tear it down. But here's here's the other part. Think of when you tear a building down, even if it's a, if, you know if it's an older building, right? And that is, by the way, that is one of the options for people. If they're if they're looking at it, it that's an option. It's like, hey, it might be worth more just to tear it down and build something way bigger and newer, right? Mm -hmm. That, but what that does to the environment, yeah. right? They, there's actually there's there's whole formulas now that are that are oriented towards well, if you take that much concrete. Right. And you destroy it and then it goes to a landfill or what, maybe you can recycle because some of them are recycling now. Anyway, long story short, to make new concrete is pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. Right. And and hard on the environment. So if, if you know, you, there's other factors at play here. Right. But you have a really good question because part um, there's uh, Ginsler Architecture was involved in the original Calgary study. And by doing that, a gentleman by the name of Steve Painter came up with an algorithm and it's very similar to the algorithm that we've built. And what we do is we run that algorithm on a property and we go, okay, how, where does this score in a conversion? How would we, how, you know, is this building convertible? We, we believe 50% of the stock could be converted mm -hmm. to residential. If you look at those studies, they say it's probably less than 10% mm -hmm. because they're looking for things like, well, does it already have windows that open? Mm -hmm. How much light gets to the core? How much distance from the core to the outside wall? And if you look at, like, take the Pan Am building in New York, for instance, right? If, if there's sections where they go, well, you can't possibly build residential in there because it's 60 feet from the elevator to the window. Like, who wants a 60-foot long mm -hmm, house, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's skinny. So we're looking at different ways that we can work with those floor plates, and we think that we can. And it, that's a, that part of that is the mixed use. There was a building in uh, New York where they actually cored a piece right from the top to the bottom to let in sun. They call mm. it a sun well. Mm. There's a building in Philadelphia that was a long 
block that they basically carved out two sections so that they could have balconies and those sorts of things. We've looked at bringing balconies in on the floor plate. So you pull the glass curtain in, now you've created balconies and then you can have live workspaces. So there's a number of ways to configure, Mm -hmm. but it's an excellent question because like the way we see it, half the buildings will not be able to be converted. You'll find a different use, like life science or something. Right, okay. And um, for these conversions, do the buildings have to be completely vacant, Doug? Or is it possible to maintain maybe some uh, commercial spaces, you know, to off- with tenants possibly to offset the costs of the rest of uh, revamp? That's my favorite question, Tony, <laughs> like, because that's, that's where we shine, right? Because we, like I said, construction without disruption. Mm. So our solution, we mm. can literally do floors without having to, to disrupt others, oh. right? Whereas almost every conversion to date, everybody has to vacate. They strip the entire building down. Now, in some cases, that is the only way because you're going to be dealing with the outside of the building and, and the MEP is just impossible to get right without having the entire building vacated. But a lot of the modern buildings, we can do 10 floors, right? Mm -hmm. So we get the MEP ready, the mechanical electric plumbing, we get that ready first. And then we just bring everything in and we connect to that. So that that's, and so a a lot of what we try to do is actually use the building's elevator system to bring everything in. Mm -hmm. So if you're using it conventionally, Right, you get more trucks showing up. You got the drywall truck. Then they drop they drop all the drywall at one time. Where does it all go? Oh, we're going to put it all on the fourth floor. Okay, well, and then they'll start pulling it up as they need it. Right. Whereas we show up, everything goes in. Mm. The entire units go in. It's all done. Right. We can do a, a floor plate in about four to six weeks versus twenty to fifty weeks. Wow. So, for sorry, where's your factory again? Where are you producing all this? So our, our partners' factories are in Calgary. Okay. So Calgary, there's three factories. Arizona, there's a big factory. Mm-hmm. Um, Northern Carolina. And then some of our other partners have factories throughout. We don't own any factories ourselves. There's enough capacity out there that we utilize. What we do is we have the designers, the project managers, and everybody else okay. in-house. So we design all that, work with the fabricators to fabricate the solution, coordinate it going on site, right? Work with the architects to design the interiors. That's how we work. And here's what's really interesting. So while you're getting a building ready, so typical construction looks, it's like a long process, right? Mm -hmm. Get the building ready, get your permits, Mm -hmm. do the plumbing. Oh, now everybody shows up, drop the drywall, drop this, drop that. So the construction guy shows up, that, 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 that. Two, three years later, you're done. We're working it so that while that first part's in progress, we've actually designed the interior and we're figuring out when we can start dropping the first floor of the building. So as soon as the MEP is ready, we show up and we can start building. And then you just go floor by floor by floor by floor and you can get people in in half the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. I'm, I'm just thinking, let's just say a commercial building is somewhat, there's still occupants in there, but it's... yeah. Fl- the floors are owned by different companies. Yep. And then all of a sudden, like... They're leasing on different floors. Leasing on different for, floors. So you're thinking staggered, like how, if you will. How, yeah. yeah, so how do you deal with a building where there, it's maybe the bottom half is vacant and then there's commercial, like there's people, tenants in the middle and then there's also vacancy at the top. So then how do you yeah. move people around? It's typic- Yeah, it's typically the building owner will offer them an incentive mm-hmm. to move them within the stack. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? So they'll say, hey, you know what? We'll give you an extra year, give you a year free, whatever, right? We're going to put the top half of this building into rentals. By the way, if you want one, let me know, right? So then you just, it's a real quick trip to work, right? right? So um, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, I don't know. But they'll move the stack, yeah. right? They'll, they'll move the people within the building, right? By the way, most conversions, they want to have the top. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right, because the, it's just, people want to be on, yeah, when they're renting, I, they want to be I think it's very tough. common commercials, maybe the first 13, 15 floors and yeah. then residential above. Yeah, plus it's, a, and plus the elevators in a building also work in, and by the way, was, uh, um, Schlumberger just came out with a whole new elevator system oh. that does nothing but mixed use building. Right. It's really interesting. So there's a lot of progress in this space, mm. right? And that and that was in Europe because same they're facing the same thing there. So this is in Germany. There was, I believe it's a 30-story building. They built it from scratch to be multi-use. Right. Right, part hotel, part residence. Right. So let's break it down to uh, per unit cost. So if someone, if a developer was to 
build the entire building from ground zero, from dirt, versus converting uh, a unit from commercial uh, or vacant to converting it to residential. What is the price per square foot if we were to break it down that way? Yeah, but see, this is where I... It's hard. Conventional construction is always price per square foot, Mm. right? So it's really going to be up to the the builder. I mean, um, if you're using our solution right? It's not going to be inexpensive, but again, how much time are you saving, right? So you really have to look at if you're going to convert a building, what is the full cost of converting the building? Everybody focuses on, well, I can do this or that at, you know, I can get cabinetry at X. I can do the wall at X. I can, so they break it down to when, and I don't blame them because that's how it's been done traditionally. Mm -hmm. But what if you looked at it holistically? What if all that was done off site and you got people in faster? What's the cost of Mm -hmm. borrowing money? Because the cost of borrowing money right, for conversion or construction especially, is expensive because it's risky. You can get caught. Look at the building in Toronto, mm-hmm. the one, right? That building's halfway done. Uh, what is it? $1.6 in debt and all of a sudden, bam, bankruptcy, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's a high risk to construction loans. We negate a ton of that risk, mm-hmm. right? So there, there's just so many factors at play. So we, you have to look at the cost of capital and time. Mm-hmm. And what's your ROI by by bringing in income faster? Mm -hmm. So that plays into it. Straight out, when we're looking at it, we're probably coming in anywhere, depending on what we're doing that building, we're going to be anywhere from three to 400 a square foot, right? But that's a very different interior. We have more technology. Our baseline tech is at a minimum, we put in things like water detection, water arrest. What's the most common damage in a condominium? water damage, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Always the most common. So all of our units have water detection, water arrest. Ah. So that's our baseline. And then we have the ability so that you can grab your cell phone uh, with the Honeywell systems. You can open your doors, lock your doors. You can see what's going Mm -hmm. on in your unit. You can do all of those things, right? So all of that is built into our standard baseline rental right. unit. Yeah. So it's and basically our, upgrading our the product tech. looks better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Upgrading the technology, yes. making yeah, it smarter. Yeah. We call it smart building, smart home. Yeah. 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 So we're going to make the building smarter. We're going to make the home smarter. Okay. But yeah, it's not an inexpensive proposition if you break it out mm-hmm. that way. Mm-hmm. But also got to remember, oh, I, I was getting income, you know, a year before I thought I would. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What does that look like? For mm-hmm. sure. So just think, and by the way, our interiors look a lot nicer than just basic drywall. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm hoping it's like we can get you some pictures, right? Because they, they're they just nicer. And we use a, a fire rated MDF and we we're actually developing a wall system that's a magnesium oxide that also is uh, brought in as prefab. And the sound attenuation is twice as high as any conventional apartment mm-hmm. building. And the fire rating is, oh, it's, it's at least twice, if not three times higher. Wow. Right with these solutions, so you're getting a you're getting a safer building. Uh, it's better built, a better built building. It's a smarter building, and it's done faster. If you're you're looking for these distressed buildings, like who's your client? Is it the the investor is your client, or is the the company that's going bankrupt that owns the building that's your that's who that's is that your client? Well, if 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 the building is distressed and it's going to auction, it's done. Okay, so whoever's mm-hmm. acquiring that building, it would be investors, right? Because yeah. we're working with investors. So we're working with distressed asset pools, right? Because they're, they're there. And we're actually going to be putting our own limited partnership together to do exactly that as well. Okay. So we at that, that point, you know, we're the customer. Mm-hmm. So we'll actually go in and we'll convert that space, right? Uh, and, and then hold it. Or we'll either sell it to a REIT or we'll hold it for a, a REIT that, that we'll be a part of. The company will own a piece of that as well. So that's also part of the strategy as well. So we're looking for income as well versus, but again, you have to consider us like a movie studio. So we're the movie studio, the building's the movie, right? So yeah, there's a whole lot Mm -hmm. of limited liability Mm -hmm. that goes with construction. And there's more than one studio typically involved in a film. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, who's going to be part of this project or projects because you'll put uh, several into a pool. Mm -hmm. And you also alluded to it, um, anybody that owns buildings that wants to partner with us, we're happy to do that as well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. to convert. Yes, mm-hmm. we should talk later. Uh, Doug, <laughs> <laughs> what impactful <laughs> message would you want to share with our audience? Um, good question. That's a really good question. That's your sneaky question, right? <laughs> um, uh, housing. Uh, housing 
Do we think it's a basic human need? Yes. What I really think about housing, though, is we've been building houses the same way for hundreds of years. And yet everything around us, you know, technology has changed so many things. So housing and codes Mm -hmm. have to change. A big part of why we can't do things differently is the codes are so out of date. The building codes are out of date. And the people that manage that process permitting you know, their, their, their hands are tied because they, you know, you know, there's 20,000 different building codes in the United States and Canada. Wow. Right. It's a lot. So yeah, try building, right? <laughs> so that's, yeah, so that that's a big problem. So, but to me, leaving you with the thought is that the future of housing is factory built. That's the reality. Yeah. We have to get on board with that. That is the only way you're going to, you know, figure out how to build it faster, better, smarter, cheaper. Mm. And are there right now rebates or grants or tax uh, deductions you can apply? Incentives. Yeah. What kind of incentives are you able to uh, get? So it, it, it varies. And that's a really good question because that's part of our mix as well. I mean, like, not only do you get the benefits of what we're doing, but there's also, we know there's tax incentives just in, in real estate period, right? There's, there's a whole bunch, right? So, but there's also all these programs. And the reason we're so busy this last week, I'm not sure if you you saw it, but the United States just amount, announced $45 billion uh, earmarked to upgrade buildings from uh, commercial to residential. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, guess what? Now that's what it's going to take to get the ball rolling here. Mm-hmm. But that's also going to allow us to expand our, our offering and, and to get more into figuring out how to do it faster, better, all of those types of things. Mm-hmm. But th- there's, and I mean, Canada, it's funny, Canada, who has, I think, a bigger housing problem in the United States, <laughs> is not on is really not on board. There are no real housing programs here. None. None. Right? There's, all, everybody's saying, oh, we want to do it. Or, you know, they're all, they all talk a great game. Yeah. The only, the only program we have is $4 billion set aside for building Indigenous housing. Right. That is the only program in Canada for housing. Mm. Whereas you go to the States and state by state, it's, it's, it's very different. But I will say the municipalities were the first ones to take the leap because Calgary basically offset their tax base. They said, look, we'll forward tax the base, right? So in other words, we'll take money that we know we're going to get in the future if we convert to residential and we'll give that money, mm-hmm. we'll pay it as basically an improvement cost for converting the building. Mm. And by doing that, it's the most oversubscribed. They're five years ahead of schedule. Mm-hmm. They had to shut down the program because it, the, it's in such demand. Mm-hmm. And now Edmonton basically picked up on that program. Mm. Interesting. What Very is, forward thinking. What is the, yeah, what's the vacancy rate um, in Calgary and in Edmonton? Um, I honestly don't know the numbers for Calgary and Edmonton. Mm-hmm. Like, and when you talk vacancy, wh- when I hear vacancy, I'm thinking office building. What's mm-hmm. the office building vacancy rate, right? Yeah. Because here it was at 30%, right? And higher, not anymore, mm-hmm. right? Because of all the, the activity that's going on, right? So in Minneapolis, they're at, at 40, hitting 50, yeah. right? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at office vacancy, not uh, on the other side of that coin. I can tell you that vacancy rate for housing is under one percent. Yeah, no, that every my city question that was for commercial, yeah, yeah. office, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's and the, and by the way, those are the those are the numbers that we know of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can you, when you go in because when you look at it, people tell you like I'm in this building in San Francisco. There's nobody else in it, so then I'll go and look at it like who's leasing it, right? And the building will still show us like half leased or 40% leased. It's just that nobody's going into work. Yeah, that's very interesting too. Right? Well, Doug, we always round out our episodes with the uh, five rapid fire questions as a fun game. (laughs) Oh, here we go. Do you have time for that? (laughs) (laughs) Of course I do. Yeah, I just, uh, I I, I always, I double think it later. So. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) No, just say what comes first to your mind and heart. I I got it. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, what advice yeah. would you give to this generation of agents who are starting their career in real estate? Um, your community. Okay. Build a community. Stay in a community. Right. I, 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 if you watch what's going on in the United States right now with real estate fragmenting, mm. the only ones that are going to survive, I think, the influencer TV realtors are done. <laughs> right. Like focus on your community. Mm. Right. Be part of your community. Get involved, yeah. right? That's 
that's that's that's what a realtor used to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's what the most successful ones will keep doing. That's a good Sorry, one. long answer. No, that's Excellent. great. Very inspirational. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we interviewed your wife, Kim, on our podcast. Uh, yeah. What three words would Kim use to best describe you? Oh, obstinate, um, <laughs> funny, um, kind. <laughs> We'll ask her those questions. Yeah, after. we should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Opposite will for, for sure come up. So. <laughs> I like that. I've never heard that one before. Um, what one word sums up all of your achievements and entrepreneurial spirit? Curiosity. Oh, no? yes. I yes. love that. What's a gadget or tech product yeah. every household should have? I um, don't that's, man, that's a really good question. A Roomba. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Handy. <laughs> and finally, Doug, where can our listeners find you if they'd like to get in touch or partner with you guys in some way? Uh, easy. Uh, just you can go to our website, arthurtoe.com. Okay. And uh, my email is dhayden at arthurtoe.com. Okay, awesome. Is there anything you want our listeners to know today to take mm -hmm. away from this um well if you don't if you if you don't have a house right now don't fret it like we've have been through housing crisis before this one actually looks a lot like what happened after world war ii mm. um you know a lot of people coming into the country a lot a lot of housing needed those sorts of things and things adjust right that you're seeing it now mm -hmm. i know ontario's adjusting quite rapidly so you're starting to see it so if you're looking for a new home, um, you know, it, it will happen, mm -hmm. right? Things will balance. They always do, right? Um, but it, yeah, just in terms of overall advice, it's like, and I'll leave it at this, the robots are coming, okay? So <laughs> don't feel bad about if your house is factory built, right? So just don't feel bad about it because that, we just don't have the labor anymore. Mm. So chances are your house is going to arrive on a truck, right? Um, you know, as opposed to a whole bunch of trucks and, you know, everybody taking nine months to build it. Mm -hmm. So Thank you so much, Doug, for your entrepreneurial spirit, for your enthusiasm in uh, trying to make a dent into this housing crisis that we have. Uh, we really appreciate what you're doing and uh, we really look forward to watching how this uh, this new company of yours grows. Yeah. Check in in a year uh, <laughs> well, because a lot of people have even checked in after just a couple of months ago. You've done that already. Yeah. So yeah, please check in in a year. I'd, I'd love that. So, and thank you for having me on. Great podcast, Thanks ladies. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Doug. Thank you.